starting a little bit early, I think. It's been the way I've been doing things lately. It is the 15th of December, 2023. A couple of items of interest. <clears throat> this weekend, we're going to be getting a the final result of Cardinal Becciu's whole mess in Italy. He was the latest in a line of Cardinals tasked with the financial reforms of the Vatican. And um, if I tell you the names before him were Cardinal Pell and Archbishop Vigano, you'd begin to see a pattern here. <laughs> so um, I'm going to have a report on that when it, after it's done. Well, that should happen tomorrow, which means I'll have that news video probably Monday, although I may do an initial talk about that Sunday night. And the question I have is, can things get worse under Francis today? And I say worse because, while well, it looks like he may have limited time left. I want to remind people that there were people saying the same things about John Paul II, and he was all around for a very long time, after for a lot longer than a lot of people thought he would be. So don't be ghoulishly expect, you know, hoping for something to happen. Pray for the conversion or repentance or whatever of Francis. That is a great act of charity for you to do. But uh, can things get worse? Um, to answer that question, we need to really understand that things were much worse than we thought. And so we're finally going to talk today a little bit about Henry Sear. And yes, I'm saying his name as far as I know correctly, because I listened to his the podcast version, the talk, the conference talk he gave that this article that has gone all over the Internet was a transcript of. And he himself said his name in it, and that's how he pronounced it. So that's what I'm going with. He gave this talk that has caused a lot of people to uh, take note. And it's called Pope Francis, How Much Lower Can We Sink? Published four days ago now on 1 Peter 5. <coughs> Excuse me. Huh. Not over my cold yet. But yes, that is Jorge Mario Bergoglio as Cardinal back before he was uh, allegedly uh, elected the Roman Pontiff. And he has a lot to say about this because, in fact, this thing is so long, I can't really talk about the whole thing in this video. It is the His podcast version is 45 minutes long, and I'm not just going to read to you his reading of it, especially since he has his own podcast that you can listen to linked in the 1 Peter 5 podcast. I'm going to focus on a few things he says here. Some of these are long quotes, but I'm going to read, focus on them, and we're going to talk about this because there are there's a few things you need to understand that when you read this or listen to his talking his his podcast speaking about this you come to understand that there is the, the, there is virtually no chance that they are going to attempt to make sure the next conclave has the outcome that Francis would want there's no chance that they will not do that that they are absolutely right now behind the scenes having meetings or have been for months if not longer having meetings behind the scenes with the Cardinals most allied with him, probably choosing among them who they're going to back, the one person they will back to try to get a Francis II as quickly as possible. Whether that happens or not, we don't know. If that's the final outcome, we don't know. Only our Lord knows. But there's no chance that they're not making these preparations. It's good for us to know these things. So I'm going to begin where he, he, sp he spends a lot of time talking about the Ted McCarrick stuff going on in the church. And that's important. And I'm going to have to be careful with how we talk about things because our hosts don't like you talking about that stuff in blunt terms. So we refer to it as the Ted McCarrick stuff in the church, because you know what I'm talking about when we when you invoke the name Ted McCarrick. A certain, we'll call it class of priests, comes to mind. Men who should never have been in the priesthood in the first place. These would be the spiritual sons and grandsons of Bella Dodd before she reverted back to the Catholic faith and warned the world about everything going on. And for those wondering why she didn't name names, Fulton Sheen told her not to, to name names. And given what we know now about the bishops who were in direct authority over Archbishop Sheen, it was likely that it was because Cardinal Spellman was a, a spiritual traveler with James Martin, we'll say. And that's why he was told, he told her not to out things because it would have caused an enormous amount of problem because in those days, Cardinal Spellman was considered like a walking saint, much the way a lot of people thought of Cardinal Bernadine until after he went to our Lord. So he spends a lot of time talking about the this 
illusion that has been crafted around uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, that he is a reformer, that he takes the Ted McCarrick thing very seriously, that he's worked tirelessly to end that problem. It's an illusion. There's a number of times where you can see that the Archdiocese of Buenos Aires during his time as the Cardinal Archbishop there came to bat for priests who should not have been there, who had done bad things and got caught. And a number of times he came to their defense before he was before he, he sat on the throne of Peter. Things that the College of Cardinals should have known about, but for whatever reason didn't because that would have probably factored into their decision, because one of the tasks he was given was, of course, finally taking care of this problem, doing what is necessary to get rid of the problem. And unfortunately, he's made things worse. So let's go right to this. So, quote, The facts I have just mentioned have been published in various articles, or in some cases discovered by me, in the last five or six years. And my comment on them is as follows. When I wrote The Dictator Pope, the state of my information led me to give a picture of Bergoglio as a man with certain defects of character, which ought to have been known to the Cardinals when they elected him in 2013. But in fact, the reality is far worse. What we find existed in 2013 was a situation of horrif horrific clerical deceit in the Argentinian church. And we see Bergoglio sitting squarely in the center of it. Now, I'm not accusing him of being himself financially or, or bad in the terms of the flesh, like the clerics he helped. I hearken back to the journalist de la Sinago's description of him as, quote, working carefully to impress everyone with the appearance of a plaster saint. Let's pause there. Working carefully to impress everyone with the appearance of a plaster saint. That is probably the best description I have seen of Francis's outward expression of himself in print ever. It's a remarkable turn of phrase, and that is the perfect description of Francis. Let's continue. One has to admit that Bergoglio has always been personally austere, indeed ostentatiously so, but he has combined this with a policy of surrounding himself with morally weak and corrupt persons, precisely so that he could control them and build up his own power through them. And this policy he has continued throughout his pontificate. Pause there again. Henry Sear goes uh, spends a lot of time in that article giving you examples of this from Argentina. We know about Zanchetta, we know about Rupnik, we know about how he turned a blind eye to McCarrick until he couldn't anymore. Well, this is stuff that he goes over is from Argentina, going back years and years and years. Let's go back. Continue now. We need to look at the situation that existed at the conclave of 2013, after the surprise abdication of Pope Benedict XVI. It was generally recognized that the church was facing a crisis, and Cardinal Bergoglio was explicitly chosen to make reforms, particularly in three areas. Firstly, against the... Uh, all-encompassing Ted McCarrick problem, which had gravely undermined the church's moral authority. Secondly, the morass of Vatican finances. This is where I'm going to be talking about the Betchiu story here in a couple days. And thirdly, the moral and political corruption within the Roman Curia, of which Benedict XVI had received crushing evidence in a report presented in December 2012. It was in December 2012, I believe, that it was when he announced that he was going to step down. It is widely believed that he read that report, realized he could not handle it, and that's why he issued the letters that he did, which could feed into your munis ministerium hypothesis if you so want to. If you're there. I'm not on the munis ministerium team personally, but I don't hold it against you if you are. But that could be evidence that you use in, in support of that hypothesis. But anyway, in all three of these areas, Pope Francis's pontificate, far from delivering reform, has made things infinitely worse. In case after case, we've seen Ted McCarrick types protected that eclipses anything in the past. In the area of Vatican finances, it looked at first as if Pope Francis was espousing genuine reform. He appointed Cardinal Pell with wide powers to reform the finances of various Vatican departments. But within two years, it became clear that this was an empty promise. The audit to the Vatican of departments that Pell had launched was canceled, and it was canceled by two of the men whom Francis himself had put in power, Cardinal Perelin as a secretary of state. By the way, his name is getting floated more and more as a front runner to replace Francis, Cardinal Perelin, one of the worst of the worst. Continuing, and Cardinal Becciu, his deputy at the time. Becciu, after four years of increasing power, lost the favor of Pope Francis in 2020, was effectively stripped of his cardinalate, and is on present dealing with the legal consequences of financial bad things. Back in 2017, Perelin and Becciu, between them, ordered a stoppage 
Cardinal Fell's financial reform, a series of incidents which illustrate the regime of lawless dictatorship which now prevails in the Vatican. One of them was the treatment of the layman Libero Maloney, who had appointed general auditor of the Vatican two years earlier to carry out the financial reform. In 2017, he was sacked in a circumstance suggestive of, uh, we'll call it 1940s Italy, with the Vatican police breaking into his office and confiscating his computers while well, he was given an ultimatum there, and then to resign or to be arrested. As part of the explanation for this treatment, Cardinal Becciu complained that Mr. Maloney had been spying on his superiors. In other words, that he was doing the job that he had been appointed to do. He had been appointed that, to do that by Francis. The most notorious aspect of this clampdown was the way Cardinal Pell was gotten rid of. In 2017, he returned to Australia to, to face, obviously, f false things people accused him of, for which he was, of course, uh, sent away until all the consequences of that were quashed on appeal by the by Australia's Supreme Court. By that time, it was too late for him to resume his post at the Vatican. There's every reason to believe that the Australian prosecution was instigated and assisted by figures in the Vatican as a means of stopping his reform, and Cardinal Betchew has been specifically named as the agent of this policy. End quote. I want you to think about that for a second. Cardinal Betchew was the instrument for that. That Pell had found too much. We're actually going to go back in time now. How many of you remember what Archbishop Viganò's initial job was in the Roman Curia under Benedict? It wasn't to be the papal nuncio to the United States. Before being papal nuncio, he was investigating the financial situation of the Vatican. He found billions upon billions of euros that had been disappeared and used inappropriately. He was sent as papal nuncio to the U.S. as sort of a protective punishment. That's why he was sent there, here. That's why we know who he is and everything that happened afterwards. So you get Vigano, then you get Pell, and now Cardinal Betchew. <laughs> you see a pattern here. <clears throat> Let's take a look here at the chat before we go back to things. He said he had more. He had more on Francis after more from Argentina. Um, I mean, Betchew is an interesting figure, and I tend to think that he was certainly involved in all the wrong and all the things going on there. But that actually he is being he is essentially the excuse for they're using him to sweep things away that there's no real attempt to fix things and that the vatican's own financial problems are there are what they have are reaping what they have sown richly not in only the terms of you and i not want, want, no longer wanting to give to anything except our parish building projects anymore but also because the things are so rotten there now that they that it's the finances are all tied up in ways that they can't even use. It's, it's just so ridiculous. Like I said, though, I'll have something on Cardinal Betchew soon as the outcome of his case is expected here. I think it's on Saturday. So I expect that afternoon I'll make a video. I may live stream about that Sunday evening, as I usually do these middle of the night, early morning kind of live streams. Um, but let's go back to Henry Sear. Remember, Francis was told that he was going to reform the Roman Curia. Day one, he came in and said that was what he was going to do. And it took until this past summer for that document to be issued. He worked on it for 10 years. Okay. The, it's supposed to be the crowning achievement of what he's done. Let's see what Henry Sear has to say. Quote, when we return to the reform of the Curia as a whole, the experience of the past 11 years has been as just as disastrous as the financial story. And the reason is that Pope Francis's interest is not in reforming the Curia, but in controlling it. As I mentioned before, he has always exercised his control by appointing morally weak and compromised characters to office, and they become his unconditional servants. Thus, in the first half of his pontificate, we saw the few individuals of real integrity in the Curia removed one by one. Burke, Seurat, Mueller, and Pell. And an unparalleled collection of clerical villains took their place. For example, the administration of the patrimony of the Holy See which controlled the Vatican's money, remained under the presidency of Cardinal Calcagno, an Italian cleric crook of the old school, in spite of the fact that he was under investigation for real estate things and in his previous diocese where he completely torpedoed their finances. He was also known to uh, sweep away Ted McCarrick problems in his diocese, a common theme in the Roman Curia under Francis. He remained in his powerful office and had the privilege of dining every night with Francis until he retired on, the gr on age grounds in 2018. 
an even more troubling appointment for different reasons was that of South American Archbishop Peña Pada, who stepped into the shoes of Cardinal Betchiu as deputy to the Secretary of State in 2018. Peña is a man who, as a student, was dismissed from his first seminary as morally suspect, and he is said to have made his career under the cover of a circle of um, James Martin-type priests and bishops who protected and advanced him. It has been alleged that he's fled his native Venezuela and took refuge in Rome after a serious incident which incurred the intervention of the local authorities. Nice people we have in the Roman Curia, right? This background has been no obstacle to Pena's becoming the second most powerful man in the Secretariat of State, that would be after Perilwin, the position that he still holds. He is just one example of the circle of unsavory the people from those from that region that Francis is from that have been promoted to the top of the church under Francis. And so it goes on with one scandalous appointment after another, which plunged the moral reform of the Curia ever further into the realm of impossibility. End quote. Into the realm of impossibility. The only way you're going to actually give an authentic reform of the Vatican is to is for somebody to go in and just empty the curia and then bring people back on a person by person basis and replace the rest of them wholesale. That's an undertaking that you are going to have to find nearly impossible. Even under a Pope Pius the 13th or a under a you know Gregory the 17th type of figure, which is unlikely given the state of things. But it does seem also that Francis is protected. All the things that he does would have been the end of a previous pre any other papacy. The media would have mar would, would have made him ineffective. The way his critics in the social media sphere and in the uh, the blog world and the independent media in general, you would have seen that in Catholic. You would have seen that in the Catholic News Agency, the National Catholic Register. You would have seen that from everything but the most directly controlled by the Vatican resources. You would have seen a lot of the Pope splainers out there taking him on. But for some reason, the rules don't apply to him. And this has nothing to do with the fact that he has accepted as Pope. There's something else going on because can you imagine Benedict XVI <laughs> doing this stuff? You, aside from just the uh, the absurdity of, of Benedict doing these things, if he had done them, could you imagine him getting away with it? I can't. So it seems obvious that he's protected in some way from suffering the consequences of his own actions. So case in point, during his time in Argentina as the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he was notorious for sweeping Ted McCarrick type problems under the rug. So go back to Henry Sears' report on this. Quote, these cases display a pattern of moral cynicism and clerical cronyism, which Bergoglio has shown behind the scenes while he presented the public image of a reformer. The most blatant examples of it relate to his record as a protector of Ted McCarrick kinds of priests. One is that of a Buenos Aires priest, Ruben Pardo, who was reported for doing... There was a... Imagine a, a young man who was one year under the age to drive in the United States. Okay, <laughs> right? Um... The mother of the person in question and, uh, had difficulty in getting the archdiocese to admit that the case even existed. She complained that Cardinal Bergoglio was protecting the priest in question, that he gave him lodging in a diocesan residence, and that when she tried to speak to the cardinal at the archiepiscopal residence, he had her rejected by security. The priest was finally, the civil system took care of the priest, and he eventually went to our Lord as because of the consequences of the way he lived at a Buenos Aires, the, 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 the uh, civil authorities forced the church to actually take care of the actual like mother and of the family because the Bergoglio refused to do it as Cardinal. There's another case in 2009, father Grassi was also um, the authorities there got him on Ted McCarrick things involving someone of a similar age. But while the case was in progress, the Argentinian Bishops' Conference, headed by Bergoglio, went to great expense to commission a document of 2,600 pages to assert that the priest was not the one who did this. The uh, You can imagine that the report that the issue was condemned by the, by the secular authorities as a gross attempt to in interfere with justice and to pre prejudice the judicial hearing. Meanwhile, Father Grassi himself testified that throughout the hearings he had had the personal support of Cardinal Bergoglio himself. Publicly, he said this. Francis built his entire reputation as being someone who will have zero tolerance for the Ted McCarrick topic. 
what is his credibility on that? George Ortiz, Pope Splinters, just Pope Blamers. We just tell the truth about Francis. That's all we do here. Uh, insane rabbit, please. Anybody considering leaving the church for the East, don't do that. You're not going to find salvation there. Don't do that and don't advocate that in my comments, please. I have no tolerance for that in my comments. Apostasy is not the way. Let's continue. Further, Sear points out the secular media went after Benedict XVI for not doing enough by their estimation to deal with the Ted McCarrick stuff in the church, but Francis is given an absolute pass. Okay? So, quote, if the world's media, which so viciously went after Benedict at every opportunity, have remained silent in the face of scandals which would have taken down any other papacy. And the reason is simple. That Pope Francis gives them exactly what they want. They are looking for a pope who will weaken the church and bend it to their own secular agenda. And that is exactly what Francis is giving them. This, therefore, is the key to the question. What exactly is Francis about in his pontificate? From the first, the gallery to which he has been playing has been the secular media, together with the with the with the ideological, uh, intellectual, and political establishment, and for their sake, he espouses every fashionable secular cause to the detriment of actual Catholic teaching. His words and actions have been calculated exclusively to win the approval of the world, and he has succeeded entirely, so entirely that he can afford to ignore any other constituency and to get away with a clerical cronyism and corruption for which the media would have savaged him if he had come from a conservative pope. End quote. And that is absolutely the truth. And it's so it's to the point here that when something like actually orthodox comes out of the Vatican, people trip over themselves and say how wonderful it is. I'm gonna give you an example of this just absurd story. Like literally, why does anybody care about this story? You can find my copy of it. Well, let me just give you the short version. The uh, Cardinal Fernandez was asked a question. He answered it in the form of like a dubia or something. He answered it, and the question was. Should uh, young women, young unmarried women who have a child, go receive Holy Communion? And the answer to that question is the answer, same answer today as it has always been. They are living in accordance with their state and life and have confessed their sins, then yes, they can approach the altar to receive communion. It's the church's stance on that always. This is getting like all sorts of adoration and praise from people. This is the same church teaching. Congratulations, Cardinal Fernandez. You for once, gave us an unequivocal supporting of church teaching. <sighs> okay, George Ortiz does agree with me on, okay, good. Just to make sure, I do take, I go like zero to 60, we'll say, when people do talk about um, leaving the church for some sort of external alternative. Archangel, and how about holy orthodox? Again, don't leave the Catholic Church for anything, okay? There's the, the one day the East West schism will be healed. It will be. I guarantee you it will be. We have the promise of heaven on that. Do I see a dark horse pope making it past the Papabilia? Well, let me put it to you this way, David or Melissa, whichever one it is of you is watching. I said at the beginning of this, I fully expect that because of everything we're hearing, that they are working behind the scenes right now. To make sure to, to give them the maximum chance of having a Francis II, that there there has to have been meetings between Francis and the cardinals that are of his particular choosing, and them agreeing to rally around one person. Because often the way we hear after the fact of a conclave is that there are X amount of candidates, and then the system sort of weeds them out during their process. But if they rally around one person, they might be able to ram that person through on the on the first or second ballot. I would expect that, and as uh, elsewhere, Henry Sears' article says, that when that story emerged, that they were going to actually have the next conclave held in a, quote, synodal manner, meaning letting 25% of the participants be laity, including those who can vote in the conclave, that when they rushed to deny that story, and the cardinal involved in that was a Jesuit, cut right from the mold of Francis himself, when they rushed to deny it, they the big thing that they were that the other thing that was happening at the time that nobody talked about was that they went and searched for where the leak came from. That is that story. I believe is fully still on board. It's going to happen. We'll probably get an announcement of that in the, probably February or something. Just wait. 
Sonny Jim says moments of traditionalism from Rome are meant to placate us trads. Gives the modernists a see we're not ruining the church talking point. Yeah, or one of the types of things that the modernists have no disagreement with on with historic Catholicism. Right? Like again, to receive the to go to the altar, you have to stop being engaging in, in sin, go to confession, make a firm purpose of amendment. That's that's never been a that shouldn't be a controversial thing, but in a lot of other things it is. Oh right. If there are, but uh, as a dark horse pope, um, if it's a dark horse, it may not be a good choice. That's the other thing, because the other part of this is that the conclave process. There is uh, a few key offices that are important to understand for when a conclave is being run. One is the, that office of Camerlengo, which is under the control of Joseph Tobin, Cardinal Joseph Tobin. Uh, yeah, that Joseph Tobin. Go ahead and put in the chat his uh, with the nickname people gave him if you want. <laughs> if, but he's the one who, the Camerlengo's job is to control, to govern essentially Vatican City during the, the interregnum. And part of his job will be in a conclave will be to make offices available to help facilitate meetings and things to get people talking to each other. The Vatican has done a very good job in the last 10 years of making it so that the um, cardinals barely know each other that the only people they really know are the cardinals that they talk to in Rome, meaning the cardinals in the Roman Curia. So there's your par there's Pietro Perlin, Cardinal Hollerick, Cardinal Grish, and a few others. All of them Bergolians. They're, the only cardinals they know that well are them, and then maybe ones geographically close to them or ones they have previous friendships with or whose work, for whatever reason, brings them interaction with. Most of the cardinals aren't in the Roman Curia. They're you know, they're like Cardinal Supich. He might have some job he does occasionally in Rome, but he's otherwise in the ordinary of a local diocese. That's a that's essentially that's an essential thing to uh, understand for the process of picking the Pope because they're going to vote for somebody that they know, and if the only people they know are those uh, key figures in Rome, that's not by accident. There's a lot of little administrative details they're doing for that. It's actually pretty devious. I, in a weird way, I have respect for it if they're being very careful. So don't be surprised if we, if we, when the, when we finally get a conclave, it happens either very quickly or it takes a long time, because it'll mean that there was a struggle at the conclave if it takes a long time. But if it's very quick, don't be surprised, and don't be surprised if it ends up being someone like Cardinal Grish or Cardinal Hollerick or Cardinal Togle or Turkson or somebody else. Media these days are talking about Pietro Perlin. Harlan being the Cardinal Secretary of State, who is described as being a purely political creature. I mean, that's who you put in your Secretary of State's office, right? In theory. So, uh, Catholic mailman, the uh, that term is usually referred to for the head of the Jesuits. And I guess Francis would be the head of the Jesuits, but there's actually not someone who is the actual head of the Jesuits. I don't know who he is right now. But the head of the Jesuits has that title. Good morning, Dory. I hope everything is going well for you. And um, Carol says she can't believe she caught live. She'll probably be, uh, start from the beginning when I when when I uh, disconnect here in a couple minutes. Um, uh, David and Melissa says it's David. Okay, very good. Um, but yeah, I hope that actually did answer your question on a, the possibility of a dark horse. But um, if there are any, <laughs> Jay asks Tagle is in the Philippines. Yes, he three or four years ago, he was considered like a front runner. And then he had some jobs given to him in the Roman Curia that he didn't do that well with. So maybe not. But I wouldn't necessarily mean think that to hold, a, to hold against him. How much actual administrative work do you think Francis does on a day to day basis? Probably not that much. Yes, he signs things. He issues statements. He's probably having mostly meetings than delegating work. And as long as Toggle is a competent is competent as delegating power then and delegating tasks, that might not hold against him, even though he didn't actually do very well. I think he might actually be worse than Francis and not in terms of more nasty, but he'll actually be more charismatic. <laughs> but also <laughs> I can't laugh I can't help but laugh when I see a lot of his public behavior because it is just so cringe inducing. Jay says he doubts there'll be another non-Italian for a very long time, which is why it might be Parolin or Grish. I think Mario Grish is from Italy. 
All right, folks, if you have any other questions, this is your time to get them in because we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to post a link to Henry Sears article uh, in my show notes today at return to tradition.org. I encourage you to listen to that full podcast at some point. It is 45 minutes long, so give a chance. Put it on your weekend list. It is incredible. He's an Englishman, so I don't feel the need to just reread everything. You know, I'll do that with Bishop Schneider or Archbishop Vigano because sometimes just their accents make it difficult for them to be understood. So I put that on the full text. But he's an Englishman, and he will read it. He will actually give you his speech in a more slower way than I will because I have this tendency to be a little fast in my speech. Anthony is saying, Anthony from Avoiding Babylon is saying he were going to get a holy pope next. Well, that'd be great. I'm not as optimistic as you are on that. <laughs> Maybe when uh, I come on your show in a couple in, in a week or so, if we're still on for that, we'll uh, we'll talk about that. Um, all right, everybody. Um, I have a interesting story to you for you, the follow-up to that story about the Australian priest from a couple days ago. My follow-up to that is, is going to be public in about 20 minutes, so 25 minutes from the time I'm recording this. So check that out. It is important because he has himself given a response to things, and there's an ability for you to reach out and help him out if you want. So check that out today, if you would, please. And thanks for tuning in today, folks. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.